things that we haven't had to deal with in the past. So bear with me. I've got kids at home who are also using internet for studies right now. So hopefully we have no glitches on our end here. First, I just wanted to acknowledge that we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Silk Okanagan Nation and wanted to introduce our presenters and uh, give a brief update on the agenda. So all of you should have received that already, but I'm gonna move this out of the way so I can see my screen. Um, so we have Anna Warwick Sears here, who is our executive director of the Okanagan Basin Water Board. And Anna will be speaking on She'll give an introduction to the Okanagan Flood Story Project and uh, the importance of it, how it came about, and uh, some of the general background. And then we have Julie Vandevoc as well, who is a flood risk specialist with NHC, who has been integral to this project. And uh, she and Peter also have very we, anyone that's presenting has been very important to this project, obviously, in getting it off the ground. But um, both Julie and Peter will be giving a tour of the Okanagan Flood Story site. Julie will walk through the website with everyone, and then we'll have Peter take us through some of the more technical details of the website. And then we have Dale Muir, who is a flood engineer with NHC, who will talk about next steps and how we work with this project to then move forward to help Okanagan homeowners and local governments prepare for increasing flood potential. And then we have Sue McCordoff, who is our chair of the Okanagan Basin Water Board. She's also the mayor of Asuyus. She holds many hats, um, wears many hats. And uh, Sue will be talking about the importance of this project not only as a as the chair of the OBWB, but as a mayor of Asuyus and as a resident of our valley as well. And then we are going to open it up to Q&A. And I just wanted to mention that as we go through, as Julie and the others go through the flood website, we wanted to invite the local to invite media to please put their questions in the Q&A box as they arise during the presentation and then we'll respond at the end of the presentation. And if we have time, we will then also open this up to further questions from the media. But if you want to start inputting any questions that come up as we're going through the website, we invite you to do so. And I'm just going to take a quick look here. All right. So if we're good to go then, Julie, I'm going to hand this off to you to uh, start that tour of the website. Oh, nope. <laughs> Anna, would you please provide an introduction to, this, to the project? Sorry. Uh, very happy to. Hello, everybody. Uh, great to finally be launching this. Uh, it's a, been a long, in, intricate and exciting project. It started out following the historic Okanagan Lakeshore flooding in 2017. The Okanagan Basin Water Board uh, started meeting with the three Okanagan regional districts and the Okanagan Nation Alliance and most of the local governments and band governments trying to figure out how we could get flood maps for the valley. This was had been a long-standing huge known gap. We did not, uh, we had a, only a handful of quite outdated maps and they did not cover all of the lake shore. So especially when the, you know, the floods of Calgary happened in 2013, Everybody was just looking around thinking, we need to have something like this for the valley. And then when we had our own big flood in 2017, we knew we had to really start pushing on it. Luckily, we were able to get funding for this project from the National Disaster Mitigation Program and the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. Emergency Management BC was also incredibly 
uh, essential because they provided the funding for the LIDAR, which was the uh, aerial imagery that gives a fine scale three dimensional digital elevation model to use for the maps. Altogether, about two and a half million dollars was spent on this project. So now, uh, following two years of effort, the maps are finally completed. The digital map layers are being made available to every jurisdiction in the valley for their GIS mapping systems and for their er emergency operations centers, as well as to the provincial and federal governments. The public facing version of the med public facing version of the maps is being launched today as the okanaganfloodstory.ca website. We feel that this is a very positive step forward and it's the first comprehensive set of flood, flood maps for the Okanagan Valley Bottom Lakes and Okanagan River. And although it's very eye-opening to see the maps, the mapped floodplain increase, the risk of flooding has always been with us. And now we have an opportunity to understand the risks better and to develop ways to mitigate those risks. There are many people to thank on this project, including our local and indigenous government partners from Armstrong to Soyuz. We're also very grateful to our senior government funders. And we'd like to thank the team at GOBC for help with the managing the LIDAR project and Emergency Management BC for providing expert advice on the maps. Thanks also to the Northwest Hydraulic Consultants and the other hardworking consulting teams who are, have contributed to this project. Our hope moving forward is that we'll have better prepared communities and we'll continue to work in a collaborative, concerted way toward a flood resistant Okanagan Valley. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. And now we'll take it over to Julie to uh, give us a tour of the website. Fantastic. I am doing a live screen share of the uh, Flood Story website, which is online right now. And I'm going to take us through several of these tabs. A bit of background on the development of this project. Uh, this website was under development as we finished our flood mapping project. And content from this website, uh, this website was inspired by the Calgary Flood Story map. And content from this website was developed Okanagan specific context, thanks to a lot of help from local governments and First Nations across the valley. We had input from a working group, um, significant support on the GIS, for which we are very grateful, and also a lot of uh, review from various local governments, from communications to technical staff, um, to being able to share this with many elected officials. And here is the product. So I will scroll through. A lot of this content is going to take um, some time for someone to fully appreciate. So I highly recommend you take a look yourself through the tabs. But just to get you oriented about the type of content and the information we have here, welcome to our homepage. We give a brief introduction to the project and flooding. And we try on this page and throughout the story map to share the silk perspective um, through using language, through some narrative that has been contributed um, by local First Nations, and really want to emphasize some of the perspective that they bring to flooding in the valley. We have a map for orientation, and then an outline of all of the following tabs. We have a mobile user interface designed specifically for mobile users to access some of the key map content, but this application is much better interacted with fully on a desktop. We discuss the use and limitations, um, provide a contact us address, and invite members of the public to share their flood stories and photos with us, which after review will appear on the website. And a huge thank you to all of those that have contributed. Moving into our first tab, this is the meat of the project. And there is an explanatory video about what is flood mapping uh, that takes any type of user through the various steps in this project and the types of information that can be found on flood maps. There are many technical terms that are explained and expanded on here, and it's a really good way to introduce everyone to the website. 
There's then a navigation tab uh, that introduces the map interface and lets people know how they can interact with it and where they can find the information they're looking for. The updated mapping, along with explanation and key lake levels highlighted on the left, is provided in this map. And I'm going to pass it over to Peter for a bit more of an introduction about some of this data. Thanks, Julie. Hello, everyone. I'm Piotr Kuraj, uh, team lead for Northwest Hydraulic Consultants. I'd like to take a moment to thank OBWB and their partners for this project and everyone from our team. There were over 30 people on our team, so too many to note, but I wanted to give special thanks to Vanessa Bennett, Joel Trubelowitz, Sarah North, and Marisa Costa Cabral. And also special thanks to the people with me today, Julie Vandevac, who worked on the website as, and is presenting, and Dale Muir, who is on our technical advisory committee and will discuss next steps. So I'll provide a brief overview of the project. We simulated the water cycle referred to as the hydrology of the Okanagan River Basin shown on screen. To do this, we developed computer models which used climate data from 1950 to present and also into the future to 2100 to assess climate change impacts. The Okanagan Lake Regulation System, being the Okanagan River dams and how these are operated, were included in the computer models. We also included the impact of the Similkameen River, shown bottom left inset, on backwatering into a Soyuz Lake and having the potential to further raise water levels in that lake. The computer models allowed us to look at extreme water levels in the valley bottom lakes and extreme flows in the river to determine the depth of water for the floodplain mapping. The extent of the floodplain mapping is shown by the purple outline which covers the Okanagan River and its valley bottom lakes. The floodplain mapping for the lake shores also includes the impact of waves and their run up onto the land. I'll now walk everyone through some examples of the floodplain maps online. I've prepared some screenshots so we don't have to wait for the files to load. Here's a location in Kelowna on the shoreline of Okanagan Lake. I've added a schematic on the bottom left, which will show the layers as I explain them. I've also added building outlines, referred to as footprints, which are accessible from the tool icon on the top left. Next slide, please. Now we've added, uh, uh, back one, please. Now we've added a green outline along the shoreline, which is the flood extent, referred to as the inundation extent of the 2017 flood. For Okanagan and Wood Kalamalka Lakes, 2017 is the design flood that was used. Everywhere else in the valley, we used a 200 year flood as the design flood. This is because 2017 is the flood of record for Okanagan and Wood Kalamalka Lakes, and it was larger than the 200 year flood. So with reference to guidelines and past studies, we use 2017 as a design flood for these lakes. Even though the flood of record was used, there's always still residual flood risk, for example, a thousand year flood, as could be used in jurisdictions like the Netherlands. Next, please. Now we show the model design flood, including climate change based on a mid-century timeframe. So as you can see, the potential for flooding in the Okanagan is expected to increase. This map shows the flood extents and depths with shades of blue, showing the range of flood, flood depth in meters. Next, please. Nothing has changed on this map, but I, I wanted to know that one of the components that is included in the flood extent and depth maps is wind setup, which is just an increase in the water level inland due to wind. For this location, it is about 10 centimeters. Next, please. Now we've added freeboard to the design flood elevation and wind setup, which is a, and freeboard is a vertical distance for this study being 0.6 meters based on guidelines and past studies, which is added to account for local variations in water level and the uncertainty in estimates of the flood level. 
models can have local errors, so freeboard is appropriate. The resulting elevation, uh, back please. Uh, the resulting elevation is referred to as the flood construction level, or FCL, which is the minimum recommended habitable building elevation. In this case, the FCL applies to the inland area away from the effects of waves. Next slide, please. On the shorelines of the lakes, the impact of waves is included in a wave effect flood construction zone, which is shown by the hatch pattern. This outlines the area affected by design waves used in the floodplain mapping. Uh, next, Julie, please. This, this wave effect flood construction zone has a separate flood construction level determined by the design flood elevation plus wind setup plus wave effects, which in this area is 1.8 meters, plus freeboard. Just a reminder that wind setup is an increase in the water level inland due to wind. Freeboard is a vertical distance added for local variations in water level and uncertainty in estimates, which in our study is 0 0.6 meters. And the flood construction level is the minimum recommended habitable building elevation. So the floodplain maps for the lakes have two flood construction levels. The inland area excludes wave effects, while wave effects are included along the shorelines. Uh, next, please. So on to an example on the river. Here's a location in Oliver with the river's dikes outlined in red. Looking at the next slide, you can faintly see, uh, back one, please. You can faintly see a, a green outline, which is the high water mark from the 2017 flood. For Okanagan River, we used a 200-year flood as a design flood following on guidelines. The 2017 flood on the river was less than the 200-year flood. So on to the next slide. Now we've added the model design flood, which is the 200-year, including climate change, to the map. The depths are shown by shades of blue in meters. Looking at the next slide, now we've added freeboard, which is that vertical distance added for ver local variations in water level and uncertainty in estimates. I'm only repeating the definitions because not everyone is familiar. So this provides us with the flood construction level, which is the minimum recommended habitable building elevation. As you can see, the flood construction level is projected across the floodplain, even through the dike. This is standard in BC and accounts for potential failure of the dike, seepage, and potential flooding from the land side of the dike. Dikes are still valuable, though, as they reduce the frequency of flooding. So on to the next slide. Now we've added flood construction level isolines which are used for identifying the actual FCL elevation. So looking at the, the next slide, if you click on an isoline, you can find the FCL, the flood construction level elevation in meters. Uh, on to the next slide, please. So this is the same location, but I've just changed the background so we can better see the next product, which is the hazard mapping. So looking on to the following slide, um, for the hazard mapping, we consider dike breach in a simplified manner using an approach from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, by simulating river flow with the left dike down, right dike down, both dikes down, and amalgamating those results. This provides hazard as flow velocities, shown here by the blue arrows, the size of which vary by velocity, magnitude. And then looking at the next slide, the other component of the hazard mapping is the flow depths, which are shown here in shades of blue. And the two components together provide hazard mapping that can be used for emergency response and risk assessments. This also helps to raise awareness about the potential for flooding, which is the first step in reducing risk, which is everyone's responsibility. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, back to you, Julie. Thank you, Peter. So that's a look at the type of information that's available on this Okanagan Lake and River floodplain map. And that is all available, all of the flood data 
infrastructure and asset layers, so you can overlay locations of key community resources with this mapping. The mapping from this project covers the Okanagan Lake and River. However, there, is, there are other flood hazards in the valley related to some of the local creeks, and any mapping that was available for local creeks is provided on this bottom tab uh, to give a more full understanding of potential flood hazard in the valley. Moving on to the next tab, we put the 2017 and 18 flooding in context with history of flooding in the Okanagan Valley. We highlight the current silk perspective and we go through various early reports of flooding and the construction projects such as channel changes and dams that occurred over the last approximately 120 years of valley history. This is quite a fun tool to go through and I encourage you to spend some time looking at some past events. At the bottom of the history tab, uh, high water images taken through aerial pho photography of the 2017 flood event are provided and by navigating through this you can click on photo points which provide a very up-close view of flood along the shoreline for lakes throughout much of the Okanagan Valley. And I mentioned earlier that people can input their flood story and photos and after review those items will appear here and they may be used for future work and analysis in the valley as well as to share people's experiences. The next tab highlights the impacts of climate change. It draws on some work that has been done in terms of the climate projections for the Okanagan Region Report done outside of this project, and then discusses how these changes apply to flooding in the valley. The Responsibility tab provides information and context for people to understand how flood and disasters are potentially governed in the area. And it highlights the Sendai framework, which is a United Nations framework that has been adopted across uh, Canada and specifically by the province of British Columbia, which includes a four pillar approach to emergency management, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And these four pillars are highlighted in the next four tabs of this website. Also on this page, there are responsibility of different agencies related to flooding, including homeowners, local and First Nation governments, provincial governments, and federal governments. So people can understand how everyone works together to reduce flood risk in the valley. The next tab highlights reducing risk and identifies strategies for property owners, uh, some land use strategies that can happen at a larger scale, and so again, some First Nations perspective. The next tab highlights how to prepare and provides resources from various government and various local, provincial, and federal governments on what people can do to prepare for a flood which might be coming shortly. Preparation starts at the reducing risk phase, but if a flood is potential in freshet season, this, in, this website provides some helpful resources. The next tab highlights response again providing information from federal and provincial governments as well as a flood warning and advisory notification system um, this links directly to the provincial flood center uh, and shows where high stream flows flood watches and flood warnings are in effect these tabs of the website are really designed to point the public to information that is available through other agencies and consolidate all flood related information in one helpful, easy to use portal. Emergency alerts and orders are also read in directly through the provincial website and provided here for reference, as well as contact information for local emergency operations centers. Flood recovery, the fourth pillar is highlighted on this page uh, as with many cleanup guides and information about the different stages of recovery and some projects which have been undertaken in the Okanagan Valley since the 2017 and 18 floods. That's the majority of the content on the website. 
This is the mobile mapping applications page that I mentioned earlier, linked on the home page. By clicking any one of these four maps, you can have a very mobile friendly view directly at some of the key data. And the final page is frequently asked questions. And here, a lot of the information in the previous pages is provided, as well as some additional information and some more highlights from the recording. And that is a tour of the Flood Story website. I'll pass it back to Corrine. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Peter. Again, if there are any questions, you are invited to include them in the Q&A section as we go along. Um, and we'll follow up at the end of the presentation. We're now going to go over to Dale Muir, who is a flood engineer at NHC. And he's again going to talk about next steps. So this is really a first step in terms of providing the information to the public and to local governments. And so he'll talk about what, what we can expect from this. Dale? All right, good morning. <clears throat> okay, so this first figure uh, presents a framework from NRCAN that depicts the process to reduce flood risk within a community. As presented earlier by Peter and uh, Julie, the current project included data collection, hydrologic analysis, um, to calculate the design floods and hydraulic modeling to calculate flood levels along the Okanagan River Basin. This data was used to prepare a series of flood inundation maps and flood hazard maps, as well as the flood story webpage to ensure the public has access to this information. The next steps, uh, Julie, yeah. The next step is for individuals, organizations, and communities to work together and reduce the flood risk. The following dozen slides are intended to further illustrate how to use the current information and move forward in reducing flood risk across the Okanagan. The first group of slides that I'll present are three steps for individual residents and property owners. These steps should also be considered for organizations and businesses, after which there'll be a couple of slides illustrating the next steps for local government. The first step is to determine the hazard potentially imposed on you. You can identify the inundation extents, flood construction level, depth, and velocity of potential flooding for a number of events from the story website flood, flood map page. Additional hazard information may be found on the history and climate pages. You should review to see how the hazards may affect where you live, work, get supplies from, or frequently pass through. As a second step, you should identify resources to help you mitigate the flood risk. This includes references and information from local government and the province on how to prepare yourself, your home, and your organization. Many of these, many of these resources are linked to from the flood story webpage at the reduced risk and how to prepare pages. Further identifying the resources, you should identify how to keep aware of the imminent flood risk. Flood forecast notifications are issued by the BC River Forecast Centre. They issue flood advisory watch and warnings to identify when water level is expected to rise rapidly, when water levels may reach or exceed bankful, and when water has or imminently will exceed bankful, and flooding is expected to result. This information is represented also on the story map, as Julie um, showed on the response page. Provided you're located in a hazard area that may require localized flood fighting, you should identify what materials you may need and where to get them and when to get them. In addition, you should determine how evacuation notifications are disseminated and where you would go if ordered to evacuate. The third step is to prepare yourself and your property. Preparation should be made as you identify risk elements and address them. This should include safety. For example, ex ensure external propane tanks are above the FCL, are anchored or otherwise protected from flooding. Ensure enclosures below the FCL, such as basements or underground parkades, do not pose an entrapment hazard if you or others go down during a flood to try and rescue vehicles or belongings. 
should also look at environmental concerns. For example, ensure stored chemicals or contaminants are above the FCL or otherwise contained so as not to contaminate floodwaters. You want the protection of your property as well. This can include raising valuables and appliances to above the FCL, installing black backflow prevention valves on your sewer system or install a sump pump for the drains. And fourthly, you, do, you want to develop an emergency plan to ensure you have the appropriate material supplies and contacts to um, accessible and a grab and go bag to in preparation of evacuation. As noted earlier, the organizations and, and businesses can follow similar steps as individuals. However, there are a couple of additional considerations. And one as shown here is the people involved. It could be a much larger number of people as well as more diverse and variable. Instead of simply family members, it could include workers and customers that may frequently or rarely access your site. This then complicates um, when and how and who distributes information about flood hazards and any local mitigation measures implemented, such as signage or detours, closures. And thirdly, uh, organizations and businesses should have a business continuity plan. Similar um, to what's under the COVID-19 challenges, businesses should identify potential disruptions to business and how to limit their impact. Local governments have a different role than individuals and businesses. Typically, the following four steps are followed to reduce flood risk. To reduce flood risk. That's um, access current, uh, or assess current mitigation measures, such as dikes, floodgates, pumps, maintenance procedures, et cetera identify gaps in the measure, measures and uh, potential new mitigation measures, prioritize and plan for improvements. Often uh, risk assessment is conducted to inform this step. And then uh, finally design and implement prioritized mitigation measures. So mitigation measures are, are often classified as either structural or non-structural measures. Um, I'll just go through some of these non-structural mitigations first. The, the first group um, on this list increased community resilience. Some are similar to the, one, the measures that were previously presented for individuals and organizations, but with more uh, holistic community view. The second group increased community robustness. That is, they increased the magnitude of a hazard that can occur without damage to the community. The second group includes zoning and bylaws. <clears throat> These are often the first action conducted by local communities following development of new floodplain maps. This is because they often have um, relatively low cost to the government and have some of the greatest long-term benefits to the community in reducing flood risk. Zoning may require mitigation measures be incorporated for any future development within a hazard or limit any increase in density or limit the type of land use or avoid increasing flood risk. Um, um, zoning may also dictate additional setbacks as conditions for land use changes to allow for future raising or setting back of dikes or other flood risk improvements. Bylaws, on the other hand, are often prescriptive for development within identified flood hazard areas. Typically, this includes defining a minimum setback from the source of flooding and a minimum flood construction level. However, uh, often included is that is a site-specific flood hazard assessment to be conducted by a qualified professional for the specific development and the specific site. Structural mitigation measures are, are typically deployed to protect development that has already occurred in a flood hazard area. The most commonly thought of measures is dikes, which have been used extensively along the Okanagan River. In addition, the series of dams and upstream lakes attenuate flood flows in the Okanagan, and this reduces the risk for downstream communities. Structural mitigation measures are often desired by the communities as they can be very effective at reducing the frequency of flooding without much disturbance to adjacent land use. However, there's often high capital cost, high maintenance cost, and a residual risk. That is, the level of protection provided by structures may be exceeded or structures can otherwise fail. In either case, the resulting flood event can be substantially more catastrophic than if the structures were not developed in the first place. Due to the high cost and balance of risk, a risk assessment is recommended to inform decisions on new or substantial changes to structural mitigation measures. And uh, I just thought I'd provide a, an example of 
another community in BC, which has gone through this flood risk reduction process. Fernie is located on the southeast corner of the province with a population of around 5,000 to 6,000 people. It too has a high recreational component of the community. And between 2014 and 2017, they financed and developed floodplain maps of the Elk River, Ferry Creek, and Coal Creek. They used the resulting information to apply for funding and then in 2019, reviewed their existing flood infrastructure and developed a plan to further reduce their flood risk. They immediately began to implement the prioritized measures with a dike extension in 2019 and again, another one planned for 2020. As well, last year they installed floodgates on creeks that flowed through embankments and dikes and left the communities behind them susceptible to back flooding. As well, they've updated their bylaws and um, the FCL for heavily developed urban areas increased by more than a meter. Development continues in this area, but with mitigation um, such as leaving the ground floor as in the entrance and garage with the majority of the home and appliances located on the second or third floor. As many of the communities across BC have floodplain maps that are 30 or more years old, there are a number of examples of communities that have or are in the process of updating floodplain maps and reevaluating their flood mitigation strategies. Um, that's it, Julie. And I think um, that that's all. So, Corinne, I'll pass it back to you. And I believe, Corrine, you may be on mute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're going over to Sue now. Again, Sue is our board chair of the Okanagan Basin Water Board, Mayor of Asius. And she's going to talk about the importance again of this, of this project. Sue? Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, I just want to say that the importance of this project is absolutely key to everybody, certainly in the Oak, up and down in the Okanagan, and I'm sure um, would be very helpful to other people uh, around the province, um, as we've seen over in Fernie. So I think this report is uh, very technical. It has some great graphs and photos, and it seems to me that it's very user friendly. So I, I think that's, that's very helpful. Um, this is not only Emergency Preparedness Week, uh, but it's also, we're looking at the spring freshette, and today in Asuyas, it is raining. So, you know, we've got a little, a little of everything. So this is very helpful. Um, this is a collaborative project with the Okanagan Basin Water Board and communities working together to help one another and that is really a key to all of uh, to all of this it's so important that we that we look and help one another which is really what the the basis of the Okanagan Basin Water Board is it's three three regional districts all working together and I think um, we're fortunate um, to have that ability to do that <clears throat> so um, I have lived in Asuyas for 50 years and so I've seen quite a lot of different changes over the years. I happen to live on the lake as well, but I am, am up quite high. So when the past floods in 2017 and um, the highest one, 2018, um, we certainly had to look at what was, what could we do? People were concerned. People that lived in floodplains um, did have flooding. We already have our, um, our, our sandbags and some sand ready. We're hoping that, that we won't need it this year, but we're ready just in, clay, in case. So um, climate change impacts plus um, flooding events um, means an increased risk and I remember doing sandbags for some of my friends in 1974, and that was quite a high flood year. And um, after that, I recall, because we do things in feet and inches down here, because the dam is in the States and they do it that way. So we don't think in meters, 
I mean, we should, but we think in terms of upbeat and inches. After 1974 floods, um, our roadways were built up. And I do recall that there was a, um, a the 921 was the, uh, the, the height that people were supposed to build at after that. And I think it had been um, lower than that before 1974. So all of a sudden, um, houses had to be built at 921 if you were doing a, um, that's feet above sea level. Um, if you were doing um, a, a crawl space, it could be below that, but you couldn't live down there. You couldn't have electrical things down there. Um, you couldn't have boxes of Christmas decorations down there that were going to get flooded. And I know that um, because that was some of the things that I've heard about. So now we're going to have to look again at, um, at, at thinking, is 921 for a Suez Lake high enough? Maybe we need to adjust that and, um, and look at raising that. So I think that this report is, um, gives current information. Um, it certainly will help local governments make good decisions on bylaws and land use planning. Um, I think that probably insurance companies are going to have to, to look at this. And when people build, um, building in floodplains, they're going to have to really be very careful about what they do and look at all the risks. Um, and this report will give them all kinds of information about how to move forward. So I really, um, I really think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great. Um, certainly, um, the Okanagan Basin Water Board will maintain this website going forward and, um, the, and provide GIS layers for, um, for each municipality and work together to keep up the current information and to share it. So that's really important because, you know, we kind of have a motto at OBWB and that's one valley, one water. So we all share that. And, um, and I just thank you all for the work that you do to provide this information. And I certainly hope that, um, that our planners and, um, and town staff can look at this and I find that they will be, this is easy for them to look at and get some information. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sue, that's great. All right, so we're gonna move over to the uh, media Q&A portion now. And I see that there is one question um, waiting in there from Rod, Rob Monroe from Info News. Rob's question is, from a practical point of view, does this website allow a homeowner to identify their property and say on a daily basis, let them know their flood risk after a big rain event or is there a heat wave that rapidly melts the snow, or if there is a heat wave that rapidly melts the snowpack? And uh, Julie, I'm gonna hand this over to you, please. Sounds good. Green, I can actually answer this one, Julie, if that yeah, works. Yeah, sure. So if the floods are forecast, if they're large enough to be forecast by the BC River Forecast Center, uh, they may provide an average occurrence interval or return period of the flood. So then a homeowner could review other map layers that are available, for example, the 20 year flood maps, and in conjunction with the forecasts, get an idea of the extent of the potential flooding. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. And there are no more um, written questions. So I'm going to open it up to the participants. And I've got James uh, helping me out with this as well. So um, what I would ask then is if there are further questions from the media, if you could please raise your hand and then we will, uh, just so that we don't have people talking over each other, we're gonna try and keep this moderated. So um, if you have a question, please put up your hand and uh, use that function on the Zoom. And then please introduce yourself, what media outlet you represent and ask your question. So if you go into the participants and attendees, if you could, uh, if there are any questions from the media. 
And James, just if you can uh, indicate whether or not this is working. Uh, there are no hands raised currently, but um, just so if everyone isn't familiar down at the bottom, there should be a raise hand icon. And then um, if you do that, I'll hit allow to talk and you'll be able to speak live to, to everyone. Thank you. Again, you can also use the Q&A function. Oh, and I've got one uh, from Brady Strachan. Oh, we've got one from uh, Rob Monroe. And okay. it, Rob, you might need to just unmute yourself as well. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, Rob. You just trying to follow up to the, the question and the answer about the practical use. This seems to be a tool that works for government and um, for bylaws and determining uh, flood elevations where building zones hit. but it's not a hands-on thing that a homeowner can can use to know whether this rain that's falling right now is going to flood my creek uh, you have to go to the i think if i understood correctly you have to go to the forecast center and then see where that fits into the modeling on this site so it's a it's a bit um bit of work to work around is that correct Yes. So yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd have to do a bit of, of research, uh, looking at what's forecast and how that compares to the available mapping. And sorry, I interrupted someone. I just wanted to say that the, uh, that's why we have the link through to the emergency management flood uh, page, the provincial flood page. I think the real uh, benefit of this tool to homeowners is to understand uh, what their overall risk of flooding is and preparing in advance. That's um, how it's really educating homeowners. There's all the resources in one place and thinking about their property in a way of how they minimize their own risk. Um, if you're interested in buying a property, you could learn more about it. It's risk of flooding. And then of course there's the underlying layers are vastly useful for all of the local governments in the long-term planning and zoning and land use. Julie, did you want to add something there? Just want to highlight one feature on the website. Um, when we took a look at the actual live flood mapping page, there is a direct address search tool within that. Uh, so you can type in a street address similar to Google Maps or something. Um, and you can go straight to a property. And for each property, if you click on the property, up pops information about how that property may be flooded in a design event, including the percentage of the property flooded and the potential depth that that flooding may reach, including freeboard. Uh, so that's one way that people can look very closely at their individual property. Uh, the river forecast forecasts are available on that other tab. And the information about what each predicted rainfall or heat wave uh, will do to each creek, that type of information is not something that we can find in our weather forecast. Uh, when those events become large enough that the River Forecast Center starts modeling them, there will quite likely be gauge measurements provided right in the river forecast that link to some of the information provided on the side panel uh, on that flood mapping tab. So there are a lot of connections that can be found quite, hopefully quite easily by the public, uh, but that type of real time forecasting based on precipitation or snow melt uh, on a weekly basis is something that maybe will happen in the future, but technically right now we produce maps at return period for people to use. Julie, do you want to just uh, briefly screen share that address search tool? Yes. <laughs> Confirming that we are looking at the flood maps? Yes. Thank you. So here is the address search bar up in the top, and I don't have an address at the top of my head, 
um, but you could type one of those in. Maybe you can try 1450 KLO Road, which is the regional district office. Thank you very much. So this is um, how it appears for that. And by clicking on a property, it discusses some of the information and how this should be used. And um, we can see here that 0% of this property is within either of the F recommended FCL zones and there is anticipated to be zero meters of flooding. Apparently the regional district picked a good uh, location for its offices. <laughs> okay. So um, just looking to see if we have other questions. I did see, um, apparently I can only answer this uh, live. So um, from Brady Strachan at CDC, yes, um, I will follow up with you after this to, uh, to see what we can do. Are there any other questions at all from the media? If, um, again, if you can raise your hand or type it into the Q&A, the question and answer box. Hi, Travis Lowe from Global Okanagan. Um, this is a, a good one for you, Anna. Um, how much did this cost? Can you just review that again, please? Hi, yeah. Uh, the LIDAR portion of it was around a million and a half dollars, and that included the lakeshore mapping that was, uh, lakeshore LIDAR that was used for the specific flood map development, but also the LIDAR went all the way up to the top of the ridges of the watershed. So the LIDAR project was a, a large project, and that LIDAR will be used for a whole lot of other flood mapping as well, like flood maps of uh, creeks in Vernon and Mission Creek and understanding dam safety analyses and things like that. So all the LIDAR goes all the way up to the height of land for the whole valley. And then about another million dollars was uh, used to do the flood maps themselves and the website and all of the other component analyses that went in there. We did a survey of the uh, Okanagan River, south of Penticton, a lot of other uh, component projects that went into it. And are there any other questions at all? Again, you can type it into the Q&A. Um, I've got a follow-up from Brady Strachan at CDC. Um, oh, I apologize. We're just going to go back for a moment. Um, and James, if you can set that up for Travis Lowe. So again, Anna, can you answer again what, uh, what the cost of this project was? And Travis, um, if you want to uh, let us know if is this exactly what you're looking for? Sorry, if uh, Travis, if Anna is not popping up as full screen when she's speaking, you can go over her uh, face where it appears, click the little three dots, and then hit pin video, and that should make her uh, full screen for you. And you can just tell me when to go. You're good, Anna, I think. Okay. Yeah. The total amount of funding that we got for this project was about two and a half million dollars. There was about a million and a half of funding that we got to do the LIDAR portion of the study. So that is the aerial imagery that uh, created the digital elevation model. It's a three-dimensional image of the lakeshore and all the way up to the height of land in the watershed. The entire valley has been captured with that LIDAR imagery. So we use a portion of the LIDAR for the maps that are shown in this website. And then all the other communities and partners are using the same LIDAR to do subsequent uh, flood maps and dam safety analyses and all kinds of work um, in addition to this flood mapping project. The maps themselves that are shown on the website and all of the other component studies were another million dollars on top of that. So. Um, Basically, all the money came from uh, either the provincial government or the federal government. 
for this project. And I have a question from Brady Strachan at CVC. How much of a difference do you think this website and these tools can make in the event of another year of catastrophic flooding similar, similar to what we had in 2017? And, um, one. pardon? I can, I would take that one too. All right, Anna. So I think that um, the real difference that this website makes is not the website itself. The website itself is a public communication tool to raise awareness about it, give information to the public so that they can see the studies and the, all the, you know, being transparent about what their risk is. But the layers that form the maps on the website are all within all the emergency operations centers and with all of the local government and uh, community planning systems. So everyone who is working on the immediate flood response has very, very detailed three-dimensional images of the land. They can have a sense of where the water is going to flow depending on what height it comes to. So it's a, a very powerful set of tools that allow um, the response to happen. Emergency Management BC has access to all this information and all the local governments and indigenous governments have access to it. So because of this mapping project, we are much better prepared. The public facing website, which is something that we were able to do and we thought that it was important to do that kind of communication. Julie, do you wanna add something to this? Sure. Um, one, uh, we shared this with many local government personnel and we shared this with a fire chief in particular who highlighted that this was, this would have been fantastic to have in 2017 and 18 and highlighted the importance for response personnel to be better aware of the hazard. And one key thing about putting this information on the website is that it allows people to better understand their risk. Coming back to the Sendai framework that I mentioned earlier, the framework for disaster risk reduction, one of the key priorities is an increased understanding of risk. And this website allows people to look at and understand the hazard that they may be exposed to. And from that, um, get an idea of their risk. So it's really moving towards uh, helping people understand what they may be exposed to and then helps us take the next steps towards individual and local government mitigation. Thank you. And uh, Travis Lowe, you had a uh, follow-up question. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, uh, hi. I uh, was just wondering if someone could give me a generic answer as to the purpose of the website and how it's going to help the average uh, person in the Okanagan. And, and that can also be uh, how it will help people plan for flooding. But I just need a generic full screen response to that. I know it's been stated already during this meeting. And then my follow up question to that is, uh, can someone talk to the uh, forecast for flooding as it stands right now so we can make it topical today? Thank you. Um, thanks, Travis. Anna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch this one to you. Okay. The purpose of this website is to make everyone, all the public and anyone who's interested, understand the risk of flooding for the lakeshore in the Okanagan. All the way from Armstrong down to Osuyus, we have mapped the edges of the lakes and the river channel and we've provided all the information in one place. We, it includes climate change information and all the other resources that people need to prepare and respond to flood risk. Corey, can I answer that too? Yeah, actually, Sue, I was hoping that you would say okay. something too, and then Anna, you can speak to the flood risk this year, or Sue, go ahead. You might be able to answer both. I was going to give, I remember the last time when we had a 2018 flood, I had a call from a homeowner, did not live on the lake, but lived a little bit inland, a couple blocks from the lake. And he said, how do I know whether my property might be uh, flooded if the lake goes up a little bit? 
if it goes up six inches or, you know, a meter or whatever, um, how am I going to know that? And I think this, um, this project answers that question and that even people not on the lake will be able to look at this and figure out what what level are they going to have to start putting sandbags around their property if they're close? So to me, it was, um, this will be very helpful. Thank you, Sue. Very practical. Um, Anna, did you want to speak to the flood forecast at this time? Well, um, Sue may actually be better uh, able to respond to that because she was just on a phone call with the River Forecast Center. My understanding is that there is uh, lower risk of flooding of the Okanagan Lakeshore, but uh, some risk for the creek systems. So I can, I can talk a little bit about that. I didn't write everything down, but that would be, um, there were three places in the province, I think, that they were not anticipating um, a huge flood, but would be the next, if it went up a little higher. One was over in, um, I think, Salmon Arm Creek, so at the north end of the Okanagan, they were concerned about that. And the other ones were over in, um, in the Caribou and, and up there they were not anticipating from the data that they have right now that there would be a flood risk in the in the Okanagan. I think it was about 115 percent of normal which is sort of to be expected at this time of year. What they did say was that it doesn't look like we're going to have floods but it all depends on mother nature. So if we have uh, cooler weather and more snow up there, or we have um, a great deal of rain all of a sudden, that could change um, the forecast. But right now, it was not a huge priority to worry about um, the flooding. Not today, anyway. My understanding is that communities are already uh, getting ready and uh, setting up sandbag stations around the valley just as a just-in-case. Anna, do you have an update in terms of Cal Lake and some of the cons... No, okay. No, I don't. All right. Okay. I know there was some concern about the Cal Lake area. Um, a good person to ask that question would be Sean Reimer at the province. He uh, manages the dams at uh, the outlet of Cal Lake and also Okanagan Lake. Right. And uh, Travis, if you need me to follow up and uh, provide contact information for Sean Reimer, I can certainly do that. Um, I'm just looking to see. Okay. Um, Travis has another question. Um, and Anna, I'll uh, send this one over to you. Can someone talk about how long this has been in the works? Did the project start after the 2017 flooding? Yes, the project started after the 2017 flooding. Where we were before 2017, we knew that there was a need for the flood maps, but there was no funding available. Then after the 2017 flooding, we had the opportunity to apply for the Federal National Disaster Mitigation Program funds. And so the project really got underway. I think it was in uh, early part of 2018, we got some additional funds from Emergency Management BC to do the flights over the valley to collect the LIDAR imagery, which was an essential first step for creating the maps. And then we were working with the three regional districts and the Okanagan Nation Alliance who all applied for the National Disaster Mitigation Program funds. And so we were able to pull all that funding together and collaboratively uh, kick off the project. I believe it was in the early fall of 2018 when it really uh, we started formally doing the mapping project. Okay. And um, again, if there are any questions, please either raise your hand or you can type it again into the Q&A box. Uh, 
and I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A. John Lawless has a question and uh, he's unmuted now. Thank you. John, if you could please uh, introduce yourself, what media outlet you're with, and uh, ask your question. Sure thing. So uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, I'm John Lawless with Castanet News in Vernon. Um, I know kind of Sue's comment about the insurance company kind of caught my interest. Is there some kind of maybe um, ripple effect that could affect so many different things, whether it be uh, insurance companies, um, renters, uh, renters insurance, like that kind of thing? Do you guys kind of anticipate any kind of ripple effect in that, in that aspect? I could uh, try to answer that. When um, I've been meeting with the provincial group on flood mapping for a number of years, and one of the key members of that group is from the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and they are huge supporters of updating the floodplain maps. I spoke on the phone to a gentleman who works for the Insurance Bureau of Canada last year, and I asked him about the insurance. He said that all the insurance companies have their own models for predicting the risk of any given property. So they've had models for a long time. They weren't necessarily based on uh, very sophisticated data. And so the insurance companies will probably use the information that we're providing to update their own uh, sense of risk. He felt that in some cases insurance might go up, but in other cases insurance might go down because if the insurance companies do not have um, very detailed, sophisticated flood maps, they're going to be erring on the very conservative side. So they're going to assume your risk is greater. So what we're doing is just providing a more accurate uh, evaluation of the risk. And it could go either way, depending on what insurance company you have, what previous models that they've been using. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And I think again, no more questions in the q and A. I'll just see if there are any raised hands again. Corey, can I just say in the um, key messages and the question and answer part, which I have printed off and is available, there is a question. My property is in the new floodplain. How does this affect my insurance? And there are some, um, there's, their answer to, it, to that is in there, um, including building climate resilience in the Okanagan. Um, that's a guidebook. Provincial government explanation, disaster financial assistance. So it, it is there and people can, um, can have a look and, um, and then maybe if they read this first, they could then figure out if that answers their question or not. Yeah, that's on the frequently asked questions tab of yeah. the website. Yeah. But the best person to answer that question would be people's individual insurance broker. Absolutely. I, I just have one more thing. I just thought I would bring you my, uh, my backpack that I leave by the door. This is my emergency supply kit. Um, I made one for each of my kids <laughs> and I have one that I leave at the door. Good idea. <laughs> That's fantastic, Sue. Um, Julie, did you want to add something? Yeah, a key message that we heard from regional districts and local governments that they wanted to convey was the flood insurance message. So there are several places on the website that discuss that and highlight the difference between overland flooding insurance, which is from lakes, rivers, and creeks, and a more typical type of flood insurance that homeowners have uh, from things like sewer or septic backup. So there is a discussion on that of that on the website, but um, it starts with talking to your insurance provider and checking what coverage you have. Thank you very much. Okay, so again, I don't see anything other, um, or rather, I don't see anything in the question and answer box. And last chance any raising of hands from the media in terms of questions um, i will be available as well um, after this to uh, we'll be putting out a news release um, out to all media um, and i will be available to um, 
take calls and send them on to those that uh, that need to answer your questions. But if there's anything else at this time. Okay, James, just going to check in with you and make sure I'm not missing anything. I think that's it. There's no more questions. No more hands okay. up. Okay. Oh, I want to, I have one more thing to say. Um, I neglected in my thanks to uh, all the partners and people who helped put this project together. I wanted to give a special shout out to Dave Orlando and Karen Katava from the Regional District of Central Okanagan who uh, did a ton of work actually building the website and bringing it all together, working with uh, Julia and her team at NHC. So thanks to those folks. Including late into the night. <laughs> So thank you to, uh, yeah, thank you to everyone who is part of this uh, really ambitious, ambitious and uh, exciting project. Okay, well, if that is all, then I will, uh, I'll end the news conference here. And uh, as I said, I'll be following up with a news release that will be going out in the next few minutes and available um, for, uh, for any phone calls uh, or emails from the media. Oh, I've got something. Uh, let me just double check something. Okay. All right. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, everybody, for, uh, for joining us today. I know it's a bit odd to be doing it this way, and we look forward to a time when we can have a, uh, a regular news conference. But uh, So I miss seeing all of you, but uh, thank you again for coming out and, uh, and joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.